Wednesday night. Here you are. Here we are. We've got uh, we've got a table filled with ladies, and I can't wait to really get into it tonight. There is so much to learn about the Word of God. This is Unraveled Hearts Bible Study, and I'm Geo. I am so glad that you are with us. And I have to turn off the music. I just want to have my music on. So, I want to let you know we're in Harlington, Texas, and Crystal Cabrera, Pastor Crystal Cabrera from City Church, have hosted us tonight, and she's made a spaghetti and just really made us feel at home here at her church. I'm so thankful that we were able to be here, and she's just been great about hosting us and, and opening up her doors to us. No fear, and I'm so thankful for that. Online, you have Eva. You have, and I'm going to butcher your last name, Eva, because that's what I do. Biliki. 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 Eva, I love you. You know I love you. You're awesome. <laughs> Eva is online, and she's going to take care of you ladies on the virtual table. She will say hello. She will put the verses up. She will make sure you feel just at home as we do, and I'm really thankful for that. You know what? We have no time to waste because we've got a full, full plate of, of God's Word tonight. So we're going to get started right now. We're going to jump right in. And the way, let me see, the way this works is we start in the book of Proverbs. We do a small uh, cheese and crackers, we like to call it, our little appetizer in Proverbs. And then we're going to jump into our new chapter in Numbers. We have been at this for over four years, uh, from Genesis to Numbers. I think we're, oh, yes, this is our 100th Bible lesson from the book of Numbers, okay? Mm -hmm. You guys, that's incredible. 100 lessons that we were able to get leaving no stone unturned in the book of Numbers, okay, just 33 chapters, and God has been good, and I bet there's so much more, but we've made a hundred, hundred weeks, that means, right, a hundred weeks, so I wanted to have a t-shirt or a glitter sign, just like they do in school, you know, a hundred weeks in school, <laughs> this is a hundred weeks, okay, the book of Numbers, you can't beat that, okay, so super stoked about that, really excited about that. We're almost at the end of this, and you better believe we're going to celebrate big time when we finish this book. We're going to have us a festival. Right now, let's jump into the Word of God. Let me pray so we can settle our hearts and our minds. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this moment. I thank you for this opportunity to be able to get into your word and share, Father God, insight. Father God, I pray that wisdom takes the stage tonight. I pray that Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. I pray that ears be opened and eyes be opened tonight. I pray that hearts be transformed as we lay ourselves down, Father God, and allow you to do surgery in our hearts with your word, Father God. I thank you, Father God, because women everywhere are becoming hungry. They're becoming desperate for you, God. And that's what, <laughs> that's what you desire. You desire hearts that are positioned towards you, Father God. And I thank you for that. I pray that like a magnet, you draw women right now, even right now, onto your word, onto the pages of this book that is ever so alive. God, I thank you. I ask, Lord God, that you have your way tonight, that you do what you need to do, that you teach us individually, that you allow us to know you deeper that you allow us to know you more, Father God. I thank you, Lord. I pray for healing 
to take place, not only in the people's minds and emotions and hearts, but Father God, I pray for bones to be healed right now, for ligaments to be healed, Father God, for diabetes to leave, for viruses and and, uh, and bacteria to be God in the name of Jesus. God, we pray for anything attacking anybody's body right now, that they be healed as they hear God's word, that you're doing miracles all over, that supernaturally you're doing great things as we press into you. We need your presence, God. We need your cloud. Settle our hearts. Settle our minds. May we remove every distraction, every distraction, every thought, every attack from the enemy that's entering our mind right now. May we cast it down in the name of Jesus and focus on you. We want to give you this time as a sweet, sweet offering in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. So we have silenced our cell phones. We have put them away, and we're going to focus on the word of God. That's why we've got Eva there, sweet Eva. We're going to press in right now. Proverbs 12. 12. What, what you can probably work me on? 7. 7. 12, 7. Now, I'm going to have Susan read it. She has the new uh, King James. She's going to read that. And then we're going to study this using three different translations. Go for it, Susan. The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. Right. And, and what do we do? How do we study this? How do we break this proverb open? I read in the three versions. Okay, looking at three different translations. The proverbs are filled with treasure. They are golden, you guys. If you wanted to, to learn the word of God and didn't know where to start, start with a proverb every day. That's a start because you're getting loads of wisdom. So let's begin by, by looking at this proverb through three different translations. Gianna, these three translations are? Hmm? Geneva, um, King James, and the uh, New Living. Perfect, yes. Okay, so the first one is the Geneva Bibles. Is this a new month? Yes. 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 That means I get to really quickly tell you about the Geneva King James and a new living. I only do that once a month. Uh, and I want to tell you that the Geneva Bible was actually written by people who got away to Geneva to translate the Word of God because the Word of God was actually uh, bolted down in the church. No one could have access to it. As a matter of fact, it was Latin. And the common folk couldn't understand it. They couldn't read it. They had to go to the priest. And then the priest would translate you know, to, to them however he saw fit because there was a lot of control in the Roman Catholic Church. So what happened is these men got away. They learned Hebrew. They learned Greek. And they translated. And they had to be in hiding because it was outlawed. You could not do that. So they did that. And if people, common folk everywhere, started reading the word of God for themselves. And they started seeing that they could go to God. That they didn't have to go to a priest. That they themselves could go to God. And that was wonderful. And then the King James. Um, so these, by the way, the people who did this eventually got caught and were burnt at the stake, okay? So that just tells you that you should appreciate this word that people have laid their lives down. The Geneva Bible actually is the, the reason we have verses. It broke it down into verses. It was the first study Bible. The King, the King James was like, heck no, we're not gonna have a commoner be the main translator for our Bible. So he got 50 scholars together in a couple of years they came up with a King James translation. And guess what? It's pretty parallel to the Geneva Bible, so that tells you how great it was. The New Living Translation came on the scene, I believe, in 1996, and that was common folk. You're going to hear it uh, here every now and then, the New Living Translation. And it's going to sound very simple. And this is why I chose these three, okay? 
because I wanted to, to get closer to the, the Hebrew or the Greek, but then I also wanted to get something modern and, and to see what that says. Okay, so the Geneva reads like this. Uh, Numbers 12, 7 says this. God, God of uh, Proverbs. Gee, while I Proverbs 12, 7. It's a pretty correct reading for it. I knew that. Okay, <laughs> Proverbs 12, 7 reads, God overthrows the wicked and they are not, but the house of the righteous shall stand. Okay? Overthrow. What is that word? What does that mean? Just whatever. Got, got rid of them. Got rid of them. What, Chandler? Take over. Take over. Remove. Remove. Okay. Yeah, yeah. To turn upside down. To demolish. To defeat, to conquer, to vanquish, to destroy. Okay? And I'm getting these definitions from the King James uh, Bible Dictionary. And then the word, okay, so we have overthrow. God himself overthrows the wicked and they are not. Now wicked, we know those are people just walking in darkness, darkness, people who don't know the Lord. But it says, but then the other side of that proverb says, but the house of the righteous shall stand. What is house? What is house? Your spirit? House? Uh-huh. Like the house of David, house of Israel type of thing? Okay. Like yeah, people? yeah, but what, what, what does that mean? Like what? Lineage? Yes, very good. So it's more than shelter, because when we think house, we think, okay, our covering, our shelter. It, our house is our family, but not just immediate. It's like your uh, lineage, right? That is the house. So here it's saying the house of the righteous shall stand. Okay? So it's not just, th think about that. Think about how sometimes we think so small, and every time God presents something to us, it's so much bigger than we can imagine. Okay. King James reads the same, except at the beginning, it doesn't say God, it omits the overthrower. It just says the wicked will be, uh, will, are overthrown and they are not. But it's pretty much the same. The Living Bible says the wicked die and disappear. Okay? But the family of the godly stands firm. And I like how they used family because that makes more you know, sense to us now we know what they're talking about, stands firm. But, but now we know when, when Geneva and King James say they are not, what does that mean? They die, they disappear, okay? So super simple, super simple. I need your thoughts to make this juicy, okay? So I need your brains here. I wanna ask you, there's great treasure here. Does this proverb motivate you to pursue righteousness for the sake of your family? Of what are your thoughts on that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, I should, I should have asked that. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. 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 yes, because we don't want to be vanquished. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't we, don't, we don't want our lineage to be cut off and have no ancestors and no one remember us. And, yeah. Yeah. Or, or the thought of destroyed, you know, we don't want to see our children destroyed or anything bad happen to them. So the only way for to prevent that would be is to teach them righteousness, to have them walk in the path of righteousness so mm -hmm. that then they make the right decisions and not be like the wicked and perish. Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the wicked overthrown? Have you seen personally the wicked overthrown? We're certainly seeing it now. I think God is out there just like, vengeance is mine. <laughs> and he's showing human traffickers, pedophilers. That Woo! Is. I love it. Tearing down uh, people in high position that are evil and wicked. Man, he's after it. He's doing this. He's overthrowing it. He's overthrowing the wicked. I think more than ever we can see that. What are your thoughts on that? Do you see it? Do you see it? 
because so many times we're like, why do they get away with it? I know four years ago, um, one of the, the biggest questions I had is, how can people be wicked and they still have you know, all this stuff, and they still get away, they do what they want, and, and they look like they're so blessed, but in reality, they're not. And, um, and now we are seeing uh, God turn things around and really overthrow the money changers, or overthrow those that were, are not, are wicked, basically. And so, um, it's awesome to be part of, of history in this moment, to get to see God do that. Let me give you my thoughts. In the wee hours of the morning, these were my um, thoughts as I was thinking about this. I, I thought about that my deepest desire is that my house stands that I never tire of running after righteousness. That even when I fail a million times, even though I may fall again and again, my desire is that the tenacity and desperation inside of me to pursue God will never cease. That I will be strong enough to get back up over and over again because there's so much at stake. I want my house to stand. That is why with my last breath, I will proclaim the goodness of God. I want my house to stand. I want my daughters to stand. I want my grandchildren to stand. I want my future generations to stand. I want those that will come from me spiritually and physically that will never even know my name. I want them to stand. Future worshipers and lovers of God's presence. There's just so much at stake for me not to run after him. So much at stake for me to never stop running after righteousness. How about you? Do you see it? Do you see what's at stake? Do you desire your house to stand? Women at the virtual table, do you desire your house to stand? Or are you simply surviving, consumed with what's happening around you, following the latest trend, focused on more about being liked and accepted by people who honestly don't even matter? Or are you just concerned with the here and the now? I pray that you not be nearsighted, that you begin to see the big picture, that you get a bigger vision, that you see what God desires to do to you and through you for future generations. Let's read Psalm 71, 18. Psalm 71, 18. <clears throat> now, also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation your power to everyone who is to come. Hallelujah. I want to declare your strength to this generation as far as I can go, as far as you can go. That should be your desire, your power to everyone who is to come, who's not even here yet, who's not even on planet Earth yet. Psalms 145.4. Psalms 145.4. Let the, each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. That one? Yes. Mm -hmm. One generation shall praise your works to another. Beautiful, beautiful. Moses tried to instill this sense of 
there's so much more at stake. He spoke about our faithfulness to God, to future generations. That was the message from God to the Israelites. Let's go to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 5, 9 through 10. And that's right after the book of Numbers, Deuteronomy 5, 9 through 10. You must never worship or bow down them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not share your affection with any other God. I do not leave unpunished the sins of those who hate me, but I punish the children for the sins of their parents to their third and fourth generations. But I lavish my love on those who love me and obey my commands, even for a thousand generations. Hallelujah. This is how God thinks. God thinks generationally. We think, what are we going to do Friday? <laughs> and God thinks generationally. And he says, if you do not, if you betray me, if you're unfaithful, I will, what does it say about to the third, fourth generation, what we will do? What will we do? This one says, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children unto the third and fourth generation. To the third and fourth generation, your sins will come to find you in the fourth generation. So some of you are dealing with that stuff because of your great, great, great grandfather, because of junk that they did, sins that they committed. And, and because of that, you don't even realize that you've got to cancel the plans of the enemy over your life because of past generations done wrong. But yet he says, for those that love me and obey me, I will lavish on you for how many generations? A thousand, a thousand generations. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. This is a firm warning about faithfulness. The wisdom in this proverb could have very well been extracted from this verse that Alona just read. This commandment from the Lord. You've got to stay hungry. You've got to stay uh, faithful, you have got to pursue righteousness that your house may stand for a thousand generations. It's a promise from the Lord. Take note of the awful destiny of those that don't walk with the Lord that we see in this proverb. They simply are no more. They simply disappear. A life wasted. No purpose achieved, leaving nothing of value for future generations. This person is destroyed. The proverb says this person is destroyed by God himself. May this proverb have you desiring righteousness. May it stir up a desire to pursue God like never before. Hallelujah. Let's go to Numbers chapter 33. As we go there, any thoughts from ladies at the table here regarding this problem? Only three left. The, yeah, only three more chapters. Okay? <laughs> so, Having said that, I need a verse. Susan's bubble right now. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting through like one verse today, aren't we? Oh my. So we're going to set up this chapter, and it's going to feel like this. Have you ever gone to the beach when the water's like really cold? You know the water's going to be cold, and you kind of walk up to the waves, and the waves touch your toes, and you back just up. Jump in. <laughs> just jump in. Just jump in. And you back up. You know, you no. just get wet. Yeah, get, no, I don't know. No, that's I me. jump in. <laughs> I get used to it real fast. Just jump in well, the cold water. That's not going to be us tonight, Susan. We're going to get our toes wet and then we're going to just kind of lean back a little bit and see what God does, okay? Mm -hmm. That's what's going to happen today. We're going to set a stage 
for this chapter. Sanche. Yes, Sanche was right. So, this chapter is going to be incredible, okay? I promise you this chapter is going to be incredible because it's going to allow us to review, to assess everything that has happened, okay? So, those of you, everything that's happened in the wilderness thus far, not just actually, not just for the Israelites, but for us as well, okay? Because as we have walked with the Israelites, it feels like we have walked with the 40 Israelites for years. 40 years. <laughs> There's stuff that has happened in our lives. For those that have just started studying this book with us or have missed several chapters, this chapter you will want to pay attention to. It will get you all caught up. This chapter will highlight all the marvelous good and bad things that have happened along the way. For those that have trekked with us most of the way or the entire way, this will be an opportunity for you not only to assess the knowledge of your scripture, you'll be able to say like, oh, I remember that, or I remember this scripture, or I remember this lesson, um, but of your biblical history and of the, Israel, of the Israelites, but you will be able to reflect on things that you yourself personally have endured, have walked through, the moments that God has been with you and your family throughout this journey, a hundred lessons so far and countless more in our personal lives walking with god not just the author of the book of numbers but the author of our lives over two years ago we started this book <laughs> in two years so much has happened some have come and gone from the table Others who have faithfully stayed at the table have become more than family through this as we journey through life together, clinging to Jesus. Because for us, the hunger stays, and we have had a front row seat at the goodness of God in the lives of the Israelites and in the lives of each other. So let's press in. Verse 1, Michelle, go for it. Numbers 33, verse 1. Let's get started. These were the stages of Israelites' journey when they went out of the land of Egypt by their military divisions under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. Wonderful. Already, this chapter starts powerfully, okay? By giving us revelation from the onset, okay? I want you to pay attention to that first sentence. The chapter starts by saying, these are the journeys. The NLT reads, this was the route, okay? So some of you might vary a little bit, but pretty much that's, that's the two main ones. These are the journeys, or that was the route. I love how in the Word of God, nothing is hidden. Nothing is covered up. Not like our families. <laughs> Not like our country, right? Nothing is covered up. Nothing is masked. Mark 4. Let's go to Mark 4, 22 through 23. So it's Matthew, Mark, 22, 4, 22 through 23. Irene? Go for it. For everything that is hidden will eventually be brought into the open, and every secret will be brought to light. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Okay. These are the words of Jesus. He says anything hidden will be revealed. Anything that's kept secret will come to light. Because not a light in the world is here. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. That's for you right there. If you have ears to hear, let, let us hear. The journey 
from Egypt to the promised land, you guys should have taken six weeks, max. Yet, here, 40 years later, <laughs> 40 years later, they have yet to enter the promised land. There, you know, these should be embarrassing facts that perhaps may not be recorded. I wonder if Moses said, is this really necessary, God? Perhaps we don't need to mention every stop or how long it took. I want you to know, and those of you who know me well know this, I love road trips. <laughs> what I love most about road trips are the stops, the picture ops, getting to venture a different road, stopping as much as possible to get everything that we can out of the trip. I remind, I remind my family, much to their chagrin, that the journey is the destination. I don't like rushing through just, just to get there. We're going when there's so much to see all around us. Don't you hate that? To have to rush over when you're like, oh, I want to see that, I want to see this. I like to take it all in. I enjoy driving. I enjoy music. I enjoy meeting new people. I enjoy off-beaten paths, and I enjoy country roads, weird and interesting places, few venture to see. I love it all. I've enjoyed driving from the West Coast to the East Coast. I love being on the road. So it was quite embarrassing when I finally got a little tiny road trip with my sweetest friend, Michelle Rubio, about just four hours away. The plan was we were gonna go drop off her son and my daughter at camp and come right back. Um, a day, or four hours there, four hours back. We had a set time to be back. It was such a great time. I was so excited to have Michelle all to myself on the way back. And I thought, ooh, this is it. We hardly have four hours to talk and really get to know each other and, you know, learn about each other. So right away, I made a mad, a mad dash to a country road and it weaved in and out. And all of a sudden, my GPS, my GPS got topsy-turvy on me. And I kind of... I had this gut, like, let's go this way. We were in mid-conversation, so I just followed the GPS. So I just allowed it to take us where it was taking us. And we chatted and chatted for another hour, <laughs> hour and a half or so, when all of a sudden we realized, we've been going the wrong direction. <laughs> we are headed to Houston, <laughs> not to South hour. Texas, the valley. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> Not in that hour moment, hour. I really got to know Michelle. <laughs> I realized this was a source of panic and fear for her. I pushed buttons in her that I didn't know she had. <laughs> and so it, it really, uh, eventually, we got on the wrong, we got the right way, and we made our way here. But by then, Michelle had had it. She was <laughs> upset. <laughs> she was getting car sick even. She was we finally I think we got home after midnight with a very aggravated Michelle who said not a word, which is actually kindness. Now that I know Michelle, <laughs> she was being very kind by not saying a word. Now that was embarrassing. I don't want that to go on my road trip resume. Okay? So it made me think about this. It made me think about the things in my life, in my journey, that I would never care to share. Because some of those pit stops are embarrassing. Some of those pit stops in our, in our lives are painful. I wonder what you have widened out from your journey that is embarrassing and painful. Abuse, mistreatment, molestation, rape, past sins, Horrible mistakes, disobedience, rebellion, fear, and doubt. 
so much that we don't care to bring up. We don't want to share, much less record for others to see our journey for other times to come. The route that we chose at times which was dark and filled with regret or tears, moments that we wish we could change. Yet here in Numbers 33, verse 1, God shows us the importance of the journey, the beauty of the journey. A journey not to hide, not to be ashamed of, but rather to use as a guide to point people to himself. Let's read verse 1 again. Crystal, can you read verse 1 again? Chapter 33, verse 1. This is the route the Israelites followed as they marched out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. The route they took was long and winding and doesn't make much sense to someone mapping it out. When we look at that map, it looks all weird. It looks like a hot mess. It too was filled with abuse, mistreatment, molestation, rape, past sins, horrible mistakes, disobedience, rebellion, fear, and doubt. From the outside, anyone looking at that map of the recorded route, of the Israelites' recorded route, would have easily thought, these guys are idiots. What are they thinking? Many times, instead of going forward, they went back. Many times, they went in circles. Man, does that sound like me? Does that sound like you? At a glance, people may think, what a joke, this is awful. Yet God's instructions to Moses were to record every part of the journey. Nothing is hidden, nothing is wasted. In fact, the NLT verse 1 reads, and that is what Crystal just read. It says, Moses to record. Read that again one more time, Crystal. This is the route the Israelites followed as they marched out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. Verse 2 goes on to write about the written record. Okay, to the written record. Eventually, the NLT mentions to record their progress. Their what? Most of the journey through the wilderness did not look like progress. At least not to the untrained eye. But if God, but if God has thought anything in our journey here, if God has taught us anything about our journey here, is that nothing is ever what it appears to be. Nothing is ever what it seems. At least not on the surface. God has trained our eyes to see what is not just right in front of us. What may look like crazy, a crazy way to get from point A to point B, what looks like so much time wasted on this journey, what may have looked like nonsense, is quite the opposite. Let's go to Psalms 119, 71 through 72. Psalms 119, 71 through 72. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I could learn your statutes. Instruction from your lips is better for me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. I want you to get that. Read that verse 71 one more time, Michelle. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I could learn your statutes. It was good. It was good that I be afflicted. Those terrible things that happened that happened and got, really got me to appreciate what God did for me, even more so. Every 
everything about the journey in the wilderness was purposeful. It was intentional. It was miraculous. Everything about our journey was and is purposeful, intentional, and miraculous. Look at how Paul explains this. Go to Philippians 1.12. Philippians 1.12, and that is... Behind, I want to say Galatians, not Ephesians. So Philippians 1, 12. Go for it, whoever has that. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. Hallelujah. Gianna, can you read that, that verse? Uh, I want to hear that translation there. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Hallelujah. Okay. So that's progress. Progress. Things were rough. This is Paul saying this. Paul is saying in Philippians 1.12, I made progress. Things have been wrong. You know, things have been rough and things got really bad and I've been wrongfully accused and imprisoned, yet this is progress because Paul learned very quickly that his life's purpose, as is ours, is for the furtherance of the gospel, for the advancement of the gospel, to push the news of Jesus forward. I wonder what that looks like if you really grasp that. If we understand that things that happen to us, the things that go wrong, the things that we've had to endure are good. They're progress because they further the gospel. How can that be? How can that be? So our life, I want you to get this. I want you to understand because this will get you to, to be victorious instead of landing on victim status. Our life, even those horrible stops along the way serve as progress because God uses things in our life to bring glory to his name. Therefore, it's progress. Everything about your journey has a purpose. And in the hands of God, it can be transformed to glory. Think about it. From Egypt, which is where the Israelites started, they started out as slaves, to the wilderness, which was a training ground, to the promised land, their final destination, the promise of God, the time in Egypt and the wilderness journey makes them appreciate the promised land even more. There was a purpose for it all. What does Egypt represent? We've talked about this before. What does Egypt represent? Sin. Sin. There we go. So the world being, being in sin. So basically, it doesn't matter if you were dancing on a pole. It doesn't matter if you had an abortion, if you cheated your husband a hundred times, if you are shut, if you shacked up with someone or many someones for years, if you lied, if you cheated, if you stole to get through life, if you pretended to be perfect and sweet but you were mean as a snake. It doesn't matter what your Egypt looked like. It didn't look good for any of us because we were slaves. We were slaves in Egypt. Slaves to sin. Romans 3.23. I believe after the book of Acts, you're going to find the book of Romans. Romans 
323. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 5 8. Romans 5 8. When God shows his love for us, and what while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, while you were still in the, in the mass, God, Christ died for you. That's how we all started off. We all started off as slaves. Numbers 33, 1. One last time. I want you to, to, to see this. I want you to see that last part of Numbers 33, 1. It says, the Israelites followed as they marched out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. Egypt was not a good place. That's why we needed to be rescued. We needed saving. We needed to be delivered from there. We needed a Moses and an Aaron, just like the Israelites. Moses was the one that delivered the Israelites out of Egypt. Who did Moses represent? Jesus. Jesus, yes. He represented the Lord. He represented Jesus, our deliverer. Let's look at that. Jesus is our deliverer. Let's go to Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke 2, 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. That's Jesus. John 4, 42. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So these were the Samaritans and, and the people around the, the woman at the well. So not just because you told us, but we know that he is the Savior of the world. Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Hallelujah. Um, if Michelle or Gianna, if you're there, one of you, can you read that? For, uh, John, for, what did I say? No, that's 4.12. Right. Four twelve. Acts 4, 12. Read that. I want to see the difference in that. The NLT kind of loses that punch. I want it like to punch you in the face, man. This is a good verse. 4, 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Galatians 5, 1. Galatians 5, 1. Christ has liberated us into freedom. Therefore, stand firm and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Hallelujah. Let's read that again. Uh, I'll read it tonight. Okay. Uh, Susan, if you're there, Galatians 5.1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. You're free! Jesus has come to set you free. He rescued us to set us free from the bondage of slavery to sin. Aaron, Moses' brother, I guess I should have asked, who is Aaron? Moses' brother. With a high, I should have asked, what was he <laughs> Israelite was the one who interceded and bridged the gap between the Israelites and God. 
Who did Aaron the high priest represent? Holy Spirit. Jesus. 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 <laughs> Again? Jesus is our high priest. The whole, yes, the whole Old Testament all points to Jesus. We have right here in Numbers 33, 1, brought two leaders up that the Israelites followed the leadership of Moses and Aaron, and both of these leaders represent Jesus. Let's go to Hebrews 4, 14. This is where we have a great high priest who has gone to heaven. Jesus, the Son, the Son of God, let us cling to Him and never stop trusting Him. The high priest of our understanding, our weakness, for He faced all the same temptations we do, yet He did not sin. So, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive His mercy. And we will find grace to help us when we need it. Okay. So I didn't get to read the whole verse. So the, the verse was Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. And that is, Michelle, were you there? Yeah. Okay. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Can you read it again? <clears throat> Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to the confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. So you see how Paul is explaining that Jesus is our high priest? Mm -hmm. Hebrews 7, 23 through 24. Hebrews 7, 23 through 24. This is Paul. The book of Hebrews was written for the Jews. It was written to connect the dots from the Old Testament, from everything that happened in Leviticus, pointing them to Jesus as the Lamb of God, connecting the mystery of the gospel, connecting those dots. And so that's the beauty of of Hebrews, of Hebrews 7, 23 to 24. Who has that? Whoever does, please read it. Shouldn't have taken you long. Hebrews is right there. Now many have come, now many have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office. But because he, but because he remains forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is always able to save those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. Hallelujah. We have a high priest that is never going to finish his term in office. We have a high priest that is forever. You know, here Paul is saying there were so many priests because they died, and then another one had to take over. But Jesus is a forever our high priest. Verse 1 in this chapter of Numbers 33 has set the stage. Nothing is hidden. This book is true. It is wisdom. It is Jesus. And like Jesus, it is alive. And therefore, it is light. And nothing is swept under the rug. This chapter records every step of their journey, even the bad and the ugly steps. The journey is the destination. So I'm breaking this up into three. One is nothing is hidden. Two, the journey is the destination. Whatever path, no matter how hard, no matter how horrific, it was. God will use it for his glory. Nothing in your life is ever wasted. Not one drop. And three, Jesus is our leader. Just like Moses and Aaron led the Israelites, he delivered us out of Egypt. 
For we ourselves were once slaves to sin, and he saved us. In the wilderness, God trains us. Because although we are out of Egypt, you got to get Egypt out of the girl. Egypt's got to come out of us. So the wilderness is our wax on, wax off for all us believers. Keep in mind that not everyone that came out of Egypt made it to the promised land. Here is a firm warning by Paul. I want all of you guys to go there. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 through 12. So 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 12. This is a plea from Paul. He is still speaking to us right now. And I want you to pay attention to this because this is powerful. This is going to lay out everything we've just been talking about. Even as we talked about Proverbs, I don't have any say on how what Proverbs falls with what lesson, but it always, Holy Spirit just beautifully connects that. And here we are. At 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 through 12. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them. All of them walked through a sea on dry ground. In the cloud, and in the sea, all were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, the same spiritual food. All of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them. And that rock was Jesus. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us. You see? You see how nothing is wasted? You see how everything was for a reason? These things happened as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did. Verse 7 our worship idols as some of the uh, or worship idols sorry or worship idols as some of them did as the scriptures say the people celebrated with feasting and drinking and they indulged again in pagan revelry and we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Jesus to the test as some of them did and then they died of snake bites. Verse 10. And don't grumble as some of them did and then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of age. We are living at the end of age, you guys. If you think, verse 12, pay attention to this. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. These are the words of Paul, and they could have been written today to us. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you right now. We thank you. We thank you because you're a good, good father. Because you have led us out of Egypt. And you continue to lead us. And I pray, Father God, for an excellent 
Exodus right now, there are many women that have yet to surrender to you as Lord, and all they have to do is believe. And I pray, Father God, that they allow you right now, right now, to be their deliverer, to be the one that takes them out of Egypt, that leads them out of Egypt right now. In Jesus' name, we thank you for that harvest that many hearts of women are getting turned, that are, are turning to the Lord, are laying themselves at the altar. Father God, I ask that as you continue to guide us, that Father God, you help us, that you help us to never, ever forget the things that you have done for us. Father God, I pray that you begin to highlight things in our lives that show us very uniquely how you were there for us, God. I pray, Lord God, that women begin to come out of the victim mentality and begin to see that their life has meaning no matter what has happened to them, no matter what they had to endure that they serve a powerful God, and they're to give that to you, and in your hands, God, you will transform it, and it'll be for your glory. I pray that that understanding in the minds of women sets in God. I pray that you begin, you begin that process of healing our emotions and our minds, God. I pray that right now, Many pursuers of truth are birthed right now. That, Father God, women are deciding not to be the same, not to be mediocre, not to be complacent about your word, but, Father God, that they are making a decision to pursue you, to run after righteousness. That the word of God become this great haven for them a safe refuge, a place where they, Father God, go for wisdom and insight, that they become women that love you with their mind and not just their emotions, God. I thank you. I thank you for the transformed hearts. I thank you for the transformed minds. I thank you for repentance, repentance that, that is taking place. I pray, Lord God, for these women, I pray, Father God, I thank you for, for those that are, are changing their mind. They're going another way. They're repenting right now. They're turning their heart to you, God. I thank you. I pray that you help us as we continue to learn your word. Keep us hungry, God. Let the hunger stay. Keep us hungry, God. Keep us thirsty that you will never, never cease to come to the table to meet with you, God. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Thank you for all the healing that took place right now. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for who you are. You are good. You are good. Thank you. Share. We have we have time to to share.